next on Viewpoint. It grieves me deeply when I hear that a woman is being paid less than a man, and that needs to stop. What does the Bible say about a woman's role in the church, family, and business? That's coming up next on Viewpoint. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Carol McLeod is a wife, author, and graduate of Oral Roberts University, also on the board of Oral Roberts at one time, and the first woman chaplain. And today she's joining me talking about the woman's role in the church, the kind of the battle that's been going on, the, the misconception that's, that's there sometimes that, uh, that women aren't at the same level as men in the church. And I think that's in all of our society. It has been for centuries. Yeah, especially the society I grew up in, mm -hmm. in the idyllic middle-class America back in the... Uh, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, you know, women could be teachers, but not the principal. They could be nurses, but not a doctor. And unfortunately, some of the church believed that as well. Well, you grew up in the church. I did. And did you feel like you were limited in some way that uh, because of my gender, I, I can't do certain things. I couldn't go into the mission field. I can't ever be a pastor. I can't speak prophecy into somebody's life. Did you ever feel limited in that way? You know, when I was growing up, I never did. Although as I look back and observe my life, I realized that what I was taught was that women could teach Sunday school and plan the annual turkey dinner. But the reason I never felt that way, Bob, was because of my parents. Because my parents had a very broad perspective on what it meant to serve God. And I remember saying, them saying to me, Carol, if you can't do it, nobody can. That they um, created a dreamer in me, mm -hmm. and they created in me a desire to serve God with every breath that I took. Yeah. And th there's, I, I don't know whether it's outside the church, and I don't want to generalize the church, but there's scriptures that people will throw up sometimes that the women should keep silence in the church, a quote from Paul, uh, that women should have their heads covered, that, that, that women should be submissive, and so they generalize these things, take them out of context. You, you think the church is still suffering from a lot of that? Oh, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. We're, we're coming out of it, I believe. But, you know, one thing I have learned about, about Paul is that when he gave those instructions to women, first of all, you have to take them contextually. Right. But also, he was always talking to a Greek church. Isn't that mm -hmm. interesting? Because in the, in the Greek, Greek world... The women were the goddesses. They were the head of the religion. Mm -hmm. So he was dealing with some different issues yeah. than perhaps with the Roman church or, or with the classic mm -hmm. Judaism. But what we have to do is look at those verses in context, and we also have to look at what Jesus said and what Jesus did. And that's where we'll mm -hmm. find the rich theology to deal mm -hmm. with women. Yeah, look at how the interchanges with, between Jesus and, and women that he met. Yes. The, the Samaritan woman. I mean, she, went, she became an evangelist, uh, the woman that, that, that went to the tomb on, on Easter morning. I mean, he spoke to them first. And yeah, women were the first ones who were told to go tell. Go tell. Go tell. Maybe you're good at telling. <laughs> I know, I know. Women are better at telling a story. And, you know, another thing is I think about the story of Mary and Martha mm -hmm. in the Bible and how it says that Mary was seated at the Lord's feet. What? That was an incredible thing. Women were not allowed to sit at the feet of a teacher. They were supposed to be in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They were supposed in to the be, background. right. But Jesus allowed Mary to be discipled by him. You know, the, the New Testament also tells us that there were groups of women who followed Jesus mm -hmm. around. But one of my favorite stories is when he fed the 5,000. Remember, mm -hmm. multiplied sure. the loaves and fishes, and we've always said, oh, 5,000 men, plus women and children. No, 5,000 men, plus women and children. Women were allowed to listen. Women were allowed to be Never in the of presence that. of a teacher. It was huge what Jesus did for women in society that day. Well, let's bring it up to today. Okay. And we look at uh, all the Me Too movement that we right. saw last, last year on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, the battle for equal pay, uh, the glass ceiling supposedly, that, that you know, it's a male-dominated society. Uh, how does a Christian woman respond to that when people are it, it really, if you look at culture sometimes, still trying to keep it down, keep mm -hmm. it down, it's male-dominated? How should a Christian woman respond to all well, that? First of all, I believe that the roots of all that is not in understanding a true biblical role of womanhood. Mm -hmm. And so when I see the Me Too movement, women who were taken advantage of sexually by men, 
when I see extremes in Christianity keep women in their place, they don't get to talk, they don't get to serve. You know what, Bob? It's really two heads of the same beast. It's, and the beast is they don't understand what the purpose of God was for women. You know, women are the civilizers of a society. Women are the beauty bringers to a society. Women have hearts of compassion. Isn't it interesting that the Bible says fathers don't provoke your children to anger because mothers tend to be more compassionate and nurturing. So we have a very significant and very important role. But you know, it grieves me deeply when I hear that a woman is being paid less than a man for the same job, if they have the same experience, same education level. That grieves my heart deeply, and that needs to stop. And, and what, how, how should a Christian woman respond to that? I mean, if they're in, a, in the workplace today, and they're going into the workplace, and, and they've got to negotiate this, uh, on what basis? I'm, because there, there is a difference at times. There is a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, so you're saying, what should a Christian woman do yeah. when faced with that situation? Rather than just, I don't, just take it or rebel against it, or how do, how do you handle that with grace and at the same time with, with uh, the, the power of what, what's, what's, what's right? Well, first of all, I think you pray. You pray for favor, mm -hmm. you pray for blessing, um, you pray that God will give you wisdom. I, I think that second of all, you talk. You go to yeah. the people and say, what is wrong with this picture? And I think the third thing is, if they're not gonna change, look for a new job. Go to where you will be appreciated. But you know, in every generation, Bob, God raises up wisdom, God raises up women to fight a cultural battle. Think about Esther, sure. think about Deborah. Mm -hmm. In every generation, God has raised up, think of Joan of Arc. Think of Mother Teresa. God raises women to fight against the inequities of the day. And, and I believe that as Christian women, we're especially equipped to do it because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against powers and principalities. So to a woman who's in that situation, I'd say, remember, it's not your boss that you're fighting. It's not the corporate board, but it's this two-headed monster that's trying to keep women from being blessed, from being leaders. So first of all, fight it on your knees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we get this, in this culture today, this blending of genders. Yeah. And there is a difference. Mm -hmm. There is a definite, I mean, women, I, I think, are more nurturing. Uh, there, there's a difference, but we, we blended a lot of that today in the, in the, uh, under the guise of either political correctness or, or something. We've either demasculinized men, I'm still not sure if that's a word, uh, or we've, uh, we've changed roles to, to compensate. Uh, what do you think about that? Is, is, that a, is that a good thing? Do we continue to change roles and make them homogenous? Or do we just define what those roles are and, and stay with those traditional def definitions but raise it to the elevation where it, where, where it should have been to begin with, the biblical uh, definition? You know, with every advancement in a culture, there's also some inherent weaknesses that come along mm -hmm. with that advancement. And as women are elevated, as they're respected, as they're appreciated for their minds, um, there's going to be some inherent weaknesses that come along, and it's what you've just mentioned. It's the blending of the genders. Mm -hmm. And God mm -hmm. never meant us to be the same. He right. always gave us significant but separate giftings for us to mm -hmm. bring to society. You know, this is what Craig and I often say. So. As I have a traditional view of marriage, and Craig is the head of our home, but I am the heart of our home. And Bob, which would you rather live without, your head or your heart? I'd like them both. <laughs> exactly. The answer is yeah. neither. I am just as vitally important yeah, to the strength and health of our family as he is. Mm -hmm. And as he quickly says, in some ways, Carol's more valuable to the strength mm -hmm. and the health of our family because of the role she plays. So I do not believe in the blending of the genders. I believe that there are some strengths that men have mm -hmm. and some weaknesses right. they have. And the same thing with women. In the, in the role of the church, do you, do you believe that it, there's a, a gender strength in any, of the, in any of the callings to the church, whether it's prophecy or teaching or preaching or hospitality? Or, are, those, are, are any of those fit better for a man or a woman? Or are they equally uh, accessible? 
I think some of them are equally accessible. I think teaching, I think a man or a woman can teach. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a man or a woman can prophesy. Um, the, the Old Testament scripture, my, so. yeah, yes. my sons and my daughters will prophesy. Mm -hmm. And we know that by studying um, the epistles and the book of Acts, that there were women who were leaders in the early church, right. who were teachers, who were uh, prophetesses in the, in the early church. But I think also, Bob, just because of the way we're built, I think that most of the time, women are better at hospitality. Most of the time. Yeah. Um, I'll most I'll of the time. I'm, I'm a better cook than some. Women. Okay, I'll give that <laughs> no, to you. And I'm, I'm making a generalization. So yeah. there, there are some mm -hmm. roles that I think are better fitting to the feminine mm -hmm. nature, some roles that are better fitting to the masculine nature, but one's yeah. not more important. Right. They're both important. And we can both nurture our children in different ways. Right. And, and they are both important. Right. Thanks again. We appreciate you being here. We're going to oh. continue this conversation with Jonathan, Jonathan Berkey in, in a little bit, but uh, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks. It was my delight, Bob. Coming up next. We have definitely seen men become very pathetic leaders in our current society. We'll hear from Jonathan Berkey about his viewpoint as we continue to examine the Bible's viewpoint about a woman's role in the church, family, and business. Well, we've heard the female perspective of uh, a woman's role in the church and a woman's, woman's role in marriage. We're going to get the other side of it right now. We've got pa Pastor Jonathan Burke with us. And uh, let's look at a couple of scriptures here, just, just to get started. Uh, Ephesians 5.22. And people quote this, uh, outside of the church, and I couldn't just generalize the church again because I don't want to attack the church, but people that are, don't know, or they don't know the Bible, they don't know the church, so they'll quote this, this scripture sometimes. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. And then the second one is 1 Timothy, and it's by Paul. It says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And people will quote these scriptures saying, Yep, the Bible and Christianity is sexist. It's male-dominated, and it's no good for today's culture. Well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that at you. Yeah, no, you, you definitely picked up two scriptures that provide a particular vantage point that when cherry picked out of scripture they give a very monochromatic view of i guess the order of things mm -hmm. or how women should act or behave uh but those are two maybe unfortunate verses to use when talking about the whole picture of god's kingdom breaking in to the world i think of the prophet joel and how he says that after the exile after the fulfillment of prophecy what God is going to do is he's going to pour out his spirit on all people. And what is the evidence of God pouring out his spirit on all people? That sons and daughters will prophesy. And Men daughters. and women will prophesy. And what does Peter say at Pentecost when the church begins, when God pours out his spirit on the early church? Peter lifts up on Pentecost that passage from the prophet Joel. Mm -hmm. This it's one of the, it's one of the few, it's one of the few times today. in Scripture. It's one of the few times in Scripture where a passage of Scripture is quoted by someone else. Mm -hmm. And Peter says, "This was what you're seeing today is what fulfilled." You're seeing, right. In what was spoken by the prophet Joel, in the last days, God says, "I'm going to pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy." And I think that more that I would ask the question, "What are your priorities in Scripture? How do you see God's mm -hmm. plan unraveling in?" God unleashing his spirit on the world. I think about the very first evangelist, a woman, a Samaritan woman yeah. that Jesus met at a well, Center right? Yeah. She went and told the town about mm -hmm. what Christ had done for her. I think about the very first post-resurrection evangelists. Who were they? Yeah. Women. Jesus doesn't seem to have a problem with entrusting <laughs> women with really, really right. important news. And I think that, I think that, Paul, the, the words of Paul are charged culturally, and they're spoken to a particular mm -hmm. context. They're spoken in, to, the, to the women in Corinth, aren't they? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the one, the one yeah. scripture is, uh, that's often reference, references in Corinth, and the other is in a letter that he right. gives to Timothy. Mm -hmm. But in, in Corinth, where he's talking about women should, should not go into the church unveiled, or their head uncovered, they need to be covered. Now, some people say, well, it symbolically is that, that covering is their husband. 
Other people say, well, it was culturally specific at that time that, that all women who went in to the temple were always covered up. So that don't, as a Christian, don't make a scene of yourself. Don't, don't look differently because we want to be culturally specific. But at the same time, it's not for today. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because in Corinthians, he both, in, in that passage about covering, he's mm -hmm. implying that women are, have roles of leadership within the church. And so for the people that would use his later quotation to say women should remain silent in the church, some scholars even think that the second quotation was added by a later editor because it just, in conversation, Paul does something he hardly ever does. He says women should remain silent in the church because it's required by the law, but he doesn't give a citation of the law. And nowhere in Mosaic Law do we have women, women should remain quiet. quiet. And so it's just a very strange quotation and citation to lift up and say, well, for 21st century North America, women should remain right. quiet in the church. It's just, it's just a, um, it's a very unfortunate yeah. argument. And there have been groups in, in, in the church, groups in, in, in Christian life that have said, no, women can't teach. They can't preach. They can teach young children. The church I went to is a, is a small child. There was a pastor. And then all of the Sunday school classes were taught by, by ladies. And all, the, all I learned about Jesus is growing up was taught by my aunts sure. in, in the church. No, I, I think that throughout, throughout history, even in cultures that have been, where, even in cultures where males have been dominant, we have seen God use women to bring about his will or to speak his word. I think about um, when Israel was waffling in the promised land and didn't have much leadership under the time of the judges, who does God raise up? Deborah. Deborah. To be the one who led the cowardly leader of the military into battle, mm -hmm. right? It's just hard to go throughout the Bible and say that there's this singular message of silence of women in the Bible. It's, it's just mm -hmm. not there if you, if you look at the whole of Scripture. Well, let's, let's expand it into that first Scripture about wives submitting to their husbands. Some people just cringe at that when they talk about submission. And, and what, how, what is the true biblical uh, uh, role when you look at uh, a husband and a wife? That's a loaded question, Bob. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to dodge the question a little bit and talk about sacred masculinity and sacred femininity. I, I think that in our culture today, we're anxious to have a conversation about men and women as genders because a lot of, those, a lot of times those conversations end up in conversations of stereotypes. Men do mm -hmm. this, women, women do, do this. this. Biologically, we have men and women. And our biology informs, has informed historically different societal roles. And I don't think that all of the societal roles that have been held by men exclusively or that have been held by women exclusively are right. I just, I want to, I want to say that. But I do think that in scripture, in different passages of scripture, you find the biological natural role of woman as the one who nurtures. nurtures. A, a woman has breasts. A mm -hmm. woman feeds children. That's biologically, a woman has babies. Biologically, there are some things that I can't do as the father of my child that my wife does for my children. Biologically, there are things that my wife can't do that I can do. Does that mean that I'm more important than her? Absolutely not. Does that mean that I'm a priority in God's agenda of the universe more than her? Absolutely not. When we come to the conversation about submission, it's really mutual submission that I believe Paul is getting after in these scriptures. And there are different opinions mm -hmm. all over Christianity about what Paul is saying in this particular scripture. But I think, I think that what Paul is reminding women in a very secular age, in a very secular Hellenistic age, is not to just railroad their husbands. Because the fact of the matter is, throughout history, women's, women, so to speak, have worn the pants in the relationship, have been the authority in the home. And I think what Paul, I don't think Paul There's is... There's people that argue with you about that. There but are, yeah. but I don't think Paul is speaking to a group of weak women saying to them, roll over. Yeah. I think Paul's speaking to a group of strong women saying to them, hey, let's see some egalitarianism in our marriages. Mm -hmm. Not, the home doesn't just have to be where the, where the woman proves her dominance. A man can assert himself in the home as well. 
Well, in the, in the rush to kind of level, level the playing field, women have become breadwinners. You see most couples are, are either the woman's outside the house working or they're both working. Men are staying home taking care of the uh, Mr. Mom. Have we overcompensated? Have we kind of demasculinized men in that rush to do that, to, to level that playing field? Well, I think that one of the things you just said is actually a really, really good thing. Sociological data, data tells us that children are better off if their fathers are invested in their lives. Invested, yes. And quite honestly, um, the, the new gig economy that we have that allows for men to be at home more and allows for women to make supplementary income, I think is a very positive mm -hmm. thing. I can't speak generally to culture as a whole on whether or not men are softening or losing some sort of a traditional role. But what I will say is we have definitely seen men, we have definitely seen men become very pathetic leaders in our current society. Mm -hmm. uh, the Me Too movement has yeah. exposed so many awful, horrific leaders who have used their power, power. to take advantage to of women, to dominate. right? To dominate. And dominance is the worst form of leadership, mm -hmm. right? So if you're saying, if, if the question would be, have some of the cultural movements taken dominance and reverence away from men? I would say, yes, they have. And that's a very, very, very good, good thing. thing. But what I, what, I would, what I would also say is though, I, I think that there's been through a lot of uh, popular media outlets, this idea of masculinity that has really perverted our perception of what is holy masculinity. The pursuit, the pursuit of possessions, the pursuit of power, um, and the pursuit of privilege position by men in our society have, have taken away the significance and the importance in men of being good nurturers and good leaders mm -hmm. in the home. And I think that we're at a place historically where we ought to be, we ought to be asking the question in the church and even outside of the church mm -hmm. and society, what does holy masculinity look like and what does holy femininity look mm -hmm. like? And try to really embrace and redefine those things, not going back to some ancient stereotypes, but really asking the question, why are why are we given these two genders? Why are we given these mm -hmm. two perspectives? Why are we given these two bodies? And how can we work to redeem those things rather than just cast them aside? So in a, in a typical church Sunday morning service, is there any gender specific roles that, that have to be played by men or women? That's a, that's a good question. So as to not alienate I mean, the, the, the viewership mm -hmm. here, I think I'm just, gonna, I, I'm just going to say that there are different opinions on this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Does it uh, depend on the, on the denomination? Does it depend on the flavor of, of that particular church? I think so. I think some of your more yeah. conservative denominations would say that men ought to be the ones preaching or speaking the word mm -hmm. of God because they privilege or prioritize men in some ways because Adam came first. Yeah. Um, and then there would be... Um, more, I guess culturally we use the term liberal denominations that would want women in leadership primarily. Um, and then you have, you have everything in between. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I wouldn't give a maxim of here's the, de here's the clear definite roles of what women should do and what men should do. But I think I would ask the question, when you're looking at scripture, what is your priority and how do you see the kingdom of God coming about, about in the world? And if you see the kingdom of God just Continually, continually pushing forward ancient paradigms mm -hmm. of leadership, then your future is going to look exactly the same right. as the past. But if, if your view of the kingdom of God breaking in is a view similar to the vision that was given by the prophet Joel, that in the future we're going to see something that we've never, never seen, seen before, before then, it's, then it's, going to re it's going to require us to reimagine what roles in the church look like. So if we reimagine that, uh, are we, are, and, and we say we're, we're going to stay traditional, you know, men in leadership, whatever that tradition is, are we, are we wasting some gifts? I mean, are, are there gifts that are being, being just wasted because they're not being used because it happens to be uh, centered in a woman rather than in a man, whether it's prophecy, healing, whether it's prayer, whether it's hospitality, whether it's, because there's some roles that we've reserved for women, it, traditionally, hospitality, some of those things. Are we, are we losing some gifts right now? Are we losing some of what, are we holding back some of what Joel has, has prophesied? There is a, 
young woman that I was uh, talking with about her own call, a college student, mm -hmm. and something that she said to me made me realize she wasn't necessarily hearing from God, but maybe hearing from the cultural influences yeah. in her head. She talked about how she was really, really passionate about ministry, really passionate about the things of God, had a strong conviction about a particular call that she felt to proclaim mm -hmm. in her life, but grew up in a home and a church in which women were not allowed to be in ministry. Mm -hmm. So she saw her only role to be one of subordination, and she perceived her call to be that as a pastor's wife. And well, learn to play the piano and learn to play the organ. Well, this woman, this woman ended up really doing in a pastor in ministry because she neglected her own call to pastoral ministry and tried to use her marriage as kind of a way, Indeed. as kind of a channel yeah. to be one in senior leadership. And I think that we need to be, I think that we need to be careful in how we are teaching people that there are right traditional forms of ministry. Uh, the Bible says in the last days, God's going to give yeah. dreams and visions to young men and to young women. And I need to be careful as a leader in the church not to allow my filter of tradition to prohibit young people from walking into, leading into the call of God on their life because it doesn't fit into my traditional paradigm of ministry in the church. If you find this program for the first time, you may have been surprised to hear viewpoints like these. Well, we want to continue to produce programs on these relevant topics, but to do so, we need your financial support of people like you. Your financial gift to help us continue Viewpoint is greatly appreciated.